Hello, dear participants. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening once again. This is Mabel Lakwe, your co-course director for the course Fundamentals of Natural Resource Governance. I want to welcome you to Model 5 of the course. We will be looking at extractive policy and regulatory framework in West Africa. The focus of the discussion will be, for, uh, will be on the ECOWAS region. As you can see, the map of the ECOWAS region consisting of about um, 15 uh, member states. Beneath the ECOWAS or within the ECOWAS, we have a sub-regional entity, which is the West African Economic and Monetary Union, um, usually made of um, countries um, from the Francophone region. Undoubtedly, the ECOWAS region is um, well endowed with um, natural resources. Unfortunately, the region is also plagued with um, extremes for extreme forms of poverty. Whereas natural resources have been a catalyst for industrialization and growth in other economies same cannot be said for the ECOWAS region, despite the significant level of mineral endowments the region possesses. So today we'll be looking at the regulatory framework at the global, regional, and the national level. So one may, uh, what are the general principles or characteristics of a legal framework. We mentioned uh, at length in our previous model, model four, but typically a good legal framework or regulatory framework should be clear that's, uh, and precise. The elements within the law or the framework should not conflict with other existing um, legislations not even in other sectors of the economy. This is because clarity is of essence because the elements within the legislation provide exclusive rights to the investor or the extractive company that will be mining the area. There shouldn't be overlapping of a mine area or overlapping of contracts that will create um, conflict around the mine area. It shouldn't also be discriminatory between local and invest, uh, foreign investors. That both local and foreign investors should be treated equally, especially at the large scale level. Usually the artisanal mining uh, uh, preferential treatments are given to um, the local private actors. Again, from our part of the world, usually the mining operation starts from the beginning, that's exploration. So preferential rights are usually given to those, who, those companies that undertake the exploration exercises. That's the... Um, the, the mining rights or uh, mining license. If the company that undertook the exploration after the exploration have a business justification to continue to move into production, the law should be such that it does not withhold the right to mine or the mining lease from the company that undertook the exploration exercise. So preferential rights to convert exploration licenses to production lines. It's also usually a moderate or fixed royalty rates. It shouldn't be um, moving within, um, it should usually be within a well-specified range. Usually you have between three to 5%. Not that it's uh, between three to 5% for this investor then another investor comes, then it's around 10%. No, it should be fixed and there should be clarity in that communication. Licensing procedures should also be transparent. Thus, any investor or any stakeholder 
or stake, um, stakeholder party interested in mining operation should be very clear with the licensing procedure such that public officials or other uh, compromised um, officials will not take advantage of the uncertainty within the system to compromise relationships with investors. It should also be consistent and protection against speculations. So now to the legal framework. As I mentioned, we'll be looking at it at the international, continental, and sub-regional and the national level. At the international level, for the purpose of this discussion, we'll be looking at the Canada's Extractive Sector Transparency Measures Act, the European Transparency and Accounting Directives, and the Dodd-Frank Act by the US. So to the Canada's Extractive Sector Transparency Measures Act. This is an act uh, owned by the government of Canada passed in 2015. The act requires that companies publicly report on their payments. Usually the act rather seeks that the private sector, that's Canadian, the companies of Canadian origin both home and abroad report on the various payments they make to the different governments whose jurisdiction that they operate. The governments are not required to disclose the receipts that they receive from the companies, but the companies, so far as you are of Canadian origin or you are listed on the Canadian Stock Exchange or related to the state of Canada in any way or form, you are required to report on your payment to government. You are required to publish those reports in accessible formats on your website and other places where it can easily be accessible by the public, particularly the citizens of the country within which you are operating. This is to promote a more transparent um, extractive sector and to have an informed public within the jurisdiction that companies related to the uh, Canadian government, whether by stock exchange or by establishment, operate to ensure that one, citizens are informed to know how much the, their governments receive from extractive operations and two, to deepen accountability mechanisms uh, from the public to be able to hold government and other states and non-state actors within the space um, accountable. It also helps in terms of um, deepening monitoring um, and evaluation of the use of extractive revenues by government. So there are some criteria uh, some criteria that um, you must meet or a certain level of threshold you must meet to be able to um, um, be to be binded by this particular act. And because of this, um, it has significantly improved the level of transparency within the extractive space. I remember even the NRG, that the Natural Resource Governance Institute, has a platform called Resource Projects that seeks to or uh, that try to report on companies' payments to government, extractive companies' payment to government, and they leverage a lot on this particular Canadian um, Extractive Sector um, uh, Measures Act to they source uh, most of their payment information from here. So it's a really great tool that is um, enhancing um, the level of transparency in terms of the revenues and benefits that are accrued from the extractive sector. As I mentioned, the governments with the, the, the governments of the countries within which these companies operate do not have any responsibility 
to report, but the responsibility rather lies on the company. That moves us to a similar act by the European um, Union, that's the European Transparency and, Accountabil and Accounting Directives. Also came into force in 2015, just like um, the Canadian, the ESMA. This also tries to promote um, a more transparent and accountable um, extractive sector. Just like the, S, the, Canada, the Canada's ESMA, it compels companies that are listed on the stock exchange of member countries of the European Union to disclose or publicly publish their payments. And the threshold is so long as the payment is equal to or greater than 100,000 um, euros, then you have to report whether to the central government, to the local authority, to other agencies like the Forestry Commission or the Environmental Agency. So far as it is above this amount, you have to report on it. Then we have the Dodd-Frank Act. This is from the US, passed in 2010, also to deepen um, transparency within the extractive space. Um, Unfortunately, um, during the era of um, President Donald Trump, this was um, repealed. Just like the others, it's also uh, part of efforts to deepen transparency uh, within the extractive sector and have informed citizens to hold their leaders or uh, managers of their extractive wealth accountable uh, as part of efforts to uh, keep corruption within the extractive um, um, space. So now moving away from the international level to the continental level, we have the African mining vision. This is a more broader governance framework that um, um, governs the mineral resource extraction or mineral resource development in Africa. The AMB requires that mineral the industrialization of Africa, just like has been used elsewhere. The main aim is to create the conditions necessary to ensure that development and structural transformation of African states are achieved through the use of mineral resources because the continent has it in abundance. I am sure we, like the, like the, in our previous model, we talked about um, ways that we can use mineral resources to drive industrialization and, 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 and diversification. Thus, the, the aim of the AMV is that through our mineral resources, we'll be able to invest in other sectors of the economy to ensure a wider economic base and also be able to um, promote sustainable um, development of our resources, such that the mineral resource sector will not be an enclave, but will ensure the general prosperity of other economic sectors and the economies of resource-rich countries as a whole. The AMV and identifies nine priority areas through which to achieve such um, sustainable, sustainable development through mineral resource development. Some of the key areas that the governance framework seek to develop and, 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 and deepen the governance uh, framework and address governance concerns are regulatory and licensing policies, in-depth knowledge of geological and mining information systems. I've talked at length concerning the, the, the ability to have a well-detailed geological and mining information system. 
according to the AMV, this provides leverage to resource endowed states to be able to um, um, share such rich information with um, investors, be able to leverage on such debt to enrich our negotiation process so that such states will not be shortchanged. Again, detailed geological information helps to be able to categorize various concessions to those that are high risk and those that are of low risk. And in that case, it helps and even provides more information to investors and it de-risk the mining operation. We have human and institutional capacity building. That's the need to uh, bridge the technical capacity gap such that in the advent of mining operation, the human resource requirement will be sourced locally or the, institution, or the institutions within the extractive sector will also have the capacity to perform their responsibilities, ensure the requisite compliance so that optimal gains can be made on behalf of the state. They need to properly integrate artisanal and small scale mining activities into the national framework, uh, better governance of the mining sector and a more participatory sector. The establishment of a transparent system that has fiscal issues, development of various linkages to, to drive more investment and diversification. We've talked a lot about linkages and diversification environmental and social issues, communication and awareness. So the AMV provides several recommendations and, 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 and areas in order to address some of the governance gaps within these um, um, nine priority areas. One main issue with the implementation of the AMV is that it is more of a uh, voluntary. The, the, there's nothing, although countries have signed on to it, um, there's no, um, how do I put it? Legally binding uh, something that, that compels countries to adopt the, the pillars and adopt the recommendations within the AMV. I keep saying that over a decade of its um, existence, um, you can barely find any country that has a full-fledged country mining vision as it was spelled out in the African mining vision because the African mining vision appreciates countries' peculiar, uh, peculiarities. So in the implementation or operationalization of the AMV, countries were required to contextualize the African mining vision into country mining vision. Uh, unfortunately, due to that voluntary element, barely um, not many countries have been able to come up with a full-fledged country mining vision at best during the implementation or the development of their national mining policies. Parts of the AMV is um, um, adopted. But even so, sometimes compliance becomes a source of concern. The oversight institution that has been tasked to oversee the implementation of the AMV is the African Mining Development Center. We also have the African Mining Governance Framework that also provides a sort of uh, implementation plan for the effective implementation of the AMV. Now we come to regulatory frameworks at the uh, sub-regional level. And as I mentioned, the focus is on ECOWAS. So at the sub-regional level, we have the ECOWAS Directive on um, Harmonization of Guiding Principles and Policies in the mining sector. We have the, we have the ECOWAS Mineral Resources Development Policy and the ECOWAS Model Law on Mining and Mineral Resource um, Development. 
I mentioned earlier that we have a sub entity, uh, a sub um, a sub regional level be, 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 um, um, within the ECOWAS, which is the West Africa Economic and Monetary Union. So they also have um, um, some governance framework, the Common Mining Code and the uh, the West Africa, the WAMU Mining Code. So in the ECOWAS region, this is a map of the ECOWAS region. The ECOWAS Directive, which was adopted in 2009, aims to ensure the harmonization of guidelines or guiding principles and policies within the mining sector in uh, West Africa. So the main aim is that across the various um, member states, the, 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 the various national mining policies should be well harmonized such that it will not breed unnecessary um, or unhealthy competition between member states, which will, at the end of the day, shortchange the, 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 the country and to the benefit of private, foreign private investors. Yesterday, I spoke um, a lot uh, in the previous model, I spoke a lot about um, how through some of this unhealthy com uh, competition, governments are able to seed off excessive tax exemptions, which in your to huge sums of foregone tax revenues, which otherwise could have been used to undertake certain development um, projects. Beyond harmonizing um, laws, some of the key objectives of the directive is also creating an enabling mining environment for sustainable macroeconomic development, providing incentives to attract investors while protecting the revenue. So as I mentioned earlier, it is very critical that um, countries look at other um, factors that create a conducive atmosphere or an enabling business environment to attract foreign direct investment other than tax exemptions. Because I mentioned that the Africa Center for Energy Policies um, study on the relevance of tax exemptions in the mining sector is not so direct. Investors look beyond tax exemptions to other factors such as political stability and enabling environment, cost of doing business, and all that. So there, it, it is critical, and that is what this directive is seeking, that countries will focus more on creating an enabling mining environment for investors to create that investment, um, investors trust in the political economy or even in the business environment, other than foregoing their um, tax revenues, their potential tax revenues through tax exemptions. Another objective is also by ensuring transparency in the process that is through policy formulation and implementation. I will not talk much about this because um, in the previous model, we spoke a lot about this. We also provide a more harmonized mining policy and legal framework, ensure that one key thing or one key issue that usually comes up when you say, let's not use tax exemptions and all that. There are some countries that come up with, or there are some experts that say that some countries have developed more than others. So if you remove the element of tax exemptions or, or those things from there, and you want them to operate on an equal level, then one country will have more leverage over the other. So this is, as, as part of creating harmonization of policies, the directive also take into account the different levels of member states in order to ensure that um, there is um, that kind of um, um, equity and not one country having more advantage over the other in terms of um, investment attraction. So that we come to the next um, ECOWAS um, legislative 
um, instrument, which is the Equals Mineral Resource Development Policy. Just like the, the, the directive for the harmonization of um, uh, principles and policies, this also seeks to remove unhealthy competition, create a more congenial um, relationships between member states and also um, ensure that um, um, the exploitation of um, natural resources are done in a more enabling environment and uh, within a more common uh, policy or political um, regime. The difference between this and the previous one we spoke about is that unlike the, the directive, which focuses mainly on, the, on, on, on minerals, solid minerals, this extends to liquid minerals such as oil and gas. So the vision for the EMRDP is to promote the exploitation of mineral resources. Mineral resources capital contribute to sustainable economic growth and integrated socioeconomic development in the region. So if you look at this one, the objective and that of the AMV are well aligned, trying to ensure a more integrated um, a more integrated um, development and a more uh, sustainable uh, socioeconomic growth. So some of the emphasis of the EMRDP is the need to promote mineral resource sector environment that fosters sustainable macroeconomic development and balances incentives to attract investors with the need to protect the revenue base and resources of member states, which is similar to what we um, discussed just uh, under the ECOWAS Directive on Harmonization Principles and uh, mineral policies. And the need to acquire geological and mineral information through the development of systemic programs. This also is directly in line with the AMV, where we talked about the need for resource rich countries to invest in geological information, to give them leverage in contract negotiation, to de risk their min mining area and also promote investment attraction. Also, again, in line with the AMV, the specific needs of ASM is taking, um, is giving priority and the need for member states to develop, manage and promote their mineral resources in order to maximize revenues from mining operations. That's not just limiting it to the private uh, sector or the foreign investor, mining and exporting, but developing the linkages that we spoke about to ensure that the gains from the sector are optimized and investment of the revenues are also done in an equitable manner, in a sustainable manner, such that in the event of the depletion of resources, there will still be a flourishing traditional economic sectors to sustain expenditure and sustained um, development. The need to promote the participation of the national private sector. Um, <clears throat> in previous models, we talked about a more participatory um, extractive sector. We talked about the advantage of having a more consultative um, approach to the development of um, um, mineral policies or development of um, legislative instruments to ensure that the private sector are involved, not just private sector limiting it to foreign investors, but the local private sector to ensure that their skills are enhanced and they possess the right techniques and competencies to be able to take advantage of the labor gap or the labor demand the sector requires. To also talk about the protection and preservation of the environment, the adoption of a harmonized institutional legislative regulatory framework in the mining sector. 
Now we have the EMDA, the ECOWAS Model of Mining and Mineral Act. The focus of this one is not really on the value chain, not really on maximizing gains on the value chain, but the focus really is on the geo-extractive sector, information um, gathering having a more um, inclusive and functional geo-extractive sector architecture, well-structured and integrated for global competitiveness. Because as I keep on saying, is the depth of your geological information that can even inform the level of investment attraction. Because such information reduces the risk of your um, mining concessions because it takes money for these foreign investors to undertake exploration activities. So if the country on its own has already invested in such um, data collection um, 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 activities and can readily provide investors with such rich data, it reduces their cost of investment and even the duration of their mine life 